Hello, my YouTube listeners. I present here a talk on Korea-India connection given in 2018 at INCO Chennai, India. My name is Karnan and I am associated with Tamil Heritage Foundation, India. I have been fascinated by this ancient connection from the day I arrived in Seoul in 2003. I have presented my findings in international seminars, conferences, public talks, and in television interviews in India and abroad. Most of my videos in YouTube on this topic was in Tamil, which is my mother tongue. After I started telling this story in social media, an avalanche of videos appeared by Tamils and off recently by Koreans as well. Unfortunately, most of the videos were casual and not based on peer research. Here is a presentation to show the interested how a history can be rebuilt based on evidences. This talk was given at INCO, the Indian Korean Center in Chennai. I thank Dr. Rathi, the director of the center, in constantly encouraging me to do research on this ancient connection. The base for this research come from two historical narratives in Korean. The first one, Samguk Sagi, and the second one, Samguk Yuza. Both these historical treatises talk about three ancient kingdoms of Korea. The one we particularly interested in is Kaya Federation, sandwiched in between Pekje and Shilla. Richard D. McBride, in his essay on preserving the lore of Korean antiquity and introduction to the native and local sources in Ilion's Samguk Usa, which was published in Akta Koreana in 2007, gives some very interesting clarification about these two important texts that we have been talking about. While Samguk Usa is not a, a Buddhist or a nationalistic response to the previous work, the Samguk Sagi. Whereas Ilion and his disciple, Hongu, compiled the Samguk Yusa to present anecdotes from Korea's rich native and local lore and to demonstrate that the tales of Korea's founders were just as good as those of China. A more fruitful way to conceptualize the relationship between the Samguk Sagi and Samguk Usa is to think of the former as more representative of official Confucian or central discourse and the later, which is Samguk Usa, as preserving the lore of Korea's antiquity. Although unavoidably influenced by Buddhist perceptions of the cosmos, the value of the Samguk Usa comes from its inclusion of many types of unofficial materials, including samples of local records, inscriptions, monastery records, strange tales, and songs in the vernacular. These local materials, filtered through the lens of Buddhist monks of the Koryo period, conserve something of the voice of the ancient and medieval Koreans. That's why Samguk Yusa is considered by some people as the Bible of Korean history or the Old Testament of Korea. There is a striking similarity between Korea and India, particularly in ancient times. In both these peninsular faraway lands, there were three kingdoms. In India, we had Chera, Chola, Pandyas, and the Oi sandwiched between Pandyas and Cheras. And in Korea, Pekje, Kaya, and Shila. Korean historians draw a glorious map of Korea in those foregone ages where Korean rules expanded in nearby China and Japan as well. However, what is important for us in this research is the tiny kingdoms of Oi in India and Kaya in Korea. 
fascinatingly, like Kaya in Korea, a kingdom called Kail existed in India too. Kail in Tamil means coastal country with swamps. Gimhe, the capital of Kaya, is a swamp land too. We talked about an ancient people of Japan called the Yayoi. The map indicates the people of Oi from India who helped Kim Siro to establish the Kaya later went to Japan as well. Look at the similarity of words I and Yayo Yi. I'll explain more on this later. Anybody familiar with Korea knows Kim's and Hu's, the most dominant clans of Korea. Kim's believe that their maternal lineage connect them to India. This belief comes from the stories of Samguk Yuza where Kim Suro was introduced as the Iron King. He was a heavenly child born out of a celestial egg. His wife, who helps him in creating a confederation, comes from India. Both meet at the shores of Gimhe through a divine dream. Mr. Parthasarvi, the then ambassador of India to Korea, narrates this story in his book called Silk and the Empress. Indian points out that this story happened in the 49th year of the common era. While one may tend to consider all these stories as myths, a startling discovery by two Korean scientists indicate that there is a scientific validity to these stories. Their research showed that the Koreans are indeed connected to South Asians through the genetic makeup. The current attention to India-Korea connection was started by Professor Dr. Kim Byung Mo of Hanyang University, Korea. Knowing very well the narratives of Ilion, he created a history through his research. His starting point was the introduction of the Queen of India to Kim Siro. On arrival, the Queen said that she came from Ayutthaya and the national symbol of her land was twin fish. Kim Byung Mo started looking for twin fish and Ayutthaya. He found on the Indian map a city called Ayodhya that sounds close to Ayutthaya and hence kept Ayodhya as his starting point. Then he recreated the passage of the Indian queen from Ayodhya to Gimhe on land. He was the one responsible for the current monument in Ayodhya for their maternal ancestry. Though the king of Ayodhya found fabled by this story, as he could not trace this history in their chronicles. Indeed, there is no such a long history for the city. If one search for Ayodhya in 49 CE, he may not find it in the Indian map. Instead, he will see Kyle Kingdom or Oi Kingdom with the same antiquity. In those ancient times, the West and the East were connected through Silk Road on land and sea. Korean historians are very well aware of these routes as shown in the Korean map obtained from the Korean National Museum in Seoul. The spread of Buddhism from India to West and East was also well established. In both sea maps, Southern India occupies an important connecting point for travelers moving from west to east and vice versa. There are plenty of literary, anecdotal and archaeological evidences to show that ancient Tamils were great seafarers. The earliest evidences of their mastery over sea was shown in the Ajatha fresco dating back to 543 BCE. Port shed with Ship graffiti belonging to 1st BC was obtained in Arika Medu archaeological sites in southern India. Sea voyages connecting Sri Vijaya and mighty Cholas of Tamaragam was depicted in Borobudur in Indonesia. 15th century paintings of European traders in India shows the Tamil vessels of those times. The most interesting evidence came from 
New Zealand where a ship bell with clear inscriptions in Tamil was found. Now that we have seen that a Roman Empire was connected to Korea via sea route and Tamil traders in between played a pivotal role in navigation and trade. It's a custom in sea travel to announce the last port of call on arrival. When Hehuan Oak, the South Indian queen, arrived in Gimhe, she announced her port of call as Ayutta. Is there an ancient port in Tamaragam sounding close to Ayutta? Yes, there is a port called Atiyutu on the Waige estuary. Atiyutu could easily be mispronounced as Ayutta. Secondly, this port was very much in Pandya Kingdom, whose state symbol was twin fish. Every temple in southern Tamil Nadu carries twin fish on their walls. It is also likely that Hehuan Oak was from the kingdom of Oi. In that part of Tamil Nadu, a lady is called Artha, meaning mother. And Artha from Oi country will be Ayutta. Hehuan Oak might have been called Ayutta, the mother from Oi kingdom. Ayodhya is not a port city at all. Professor Kim outlines an unusual map to substantiate his claim on the road instead of picking up the most familiar route of those times. Moreover, there are plenty of evidences to show that Tamils have reached faraway lands in those times such as China, Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia and Malaysia. Though Korea and Japan were visited by Indian monks for missionary purposes in the Middle Ages, only Kaya throws the challenge because of his antiquity that no Korean historians talk about this seriously. Sangam period of Tamil Nadu witnessed voyages far and away, which is derived from poetry of that period. Sangam era expands from 300 BCE to 400 CE. There is architectural and cultural resemblance of Oi to Korea and Japan. The Buddhist pagodas in Korea resembles closely the temples of present Kerala, which was part of an ancient Oi kingdom. There is amazing similarity between an Oi temple and the warrior costume of samurai of Japan. In fact, the connection between Japanese and Tamil was studied first by Professor Susumo Ono of Japan. Later, two Tamil scholars from Sri Lanka joined him and worked on the Manyoshu poetry. The Manyoshu or collection of 10,000 leaves is an anthology of ancient Japanese poems compiled during 759 common era during the Nara period, but including many earlier works. The most likely person to have assembled the collection is Otomono Yakamochi, himself a prolific poet who included nearly 500 of his own works in the Manyosho. The Manyosho is regarded as a literary classic and high point of Japanese poetry. A poem from his collection reads, On an evening when the spring mists trail over the white sea, and sad is the voice of the crane, I think of my far-off hope. This is a typical tone of Nadal Thinai with the sadness or melancholy in Sangam poetry. Dr. Manon Mani will say that without understanding the Agamarabu of Sangam period, it is hard to appreciate Manyoshu. Here ends part one of this talk. Part two will explain more convincing evidences to prove that Hekon Oak was from ancient Tamaragam and not from Ayodhya.